people. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on this show about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the respective views of any individual employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. With that said, we've got, uh, excuse me, not we, I have five movies to review for you for this show, but first let's get into my segment, What's Topping the Box Office, a rundown of the top 10 highest grossing movies of this past weekend, and there are actually a lot of surprises. I'm kind of surprised about the movie that grossed the most this weekend, and that is the movie Annabelle Creation, which I believe is the fourth movie in the Conjuring franchise, but the... Uh, the second movie about the doll Annabelle who played a key role in The Conjuring. As I said in my last week's show, Annabelle was listed as one of the worst movies of 2014 according to my list back when I was first getting a worst of any year list. That was the end of my first year of hosting words on film. So, I can't exactly say how good Annabelle Creation is until I get to the review later on, but I will say that this weekend, Annabelle Creation grossed an impressive $35 million on a $15 million budget. So just in the United States, it grossed more than twice as much as it cost to make, automatically making it a certified hit here in the States. Around the world so far, it's grossed $72.1 million, which also makes it a certified hit around the world, so very impressive. Number two at the box office this weekend is the same movie that was number two last week, and that is Dunkirk in its fourth weekend release, having grossed $10.9 million this weekend. Against a budget of $100 million, Dunkirk has so far grossed 10.9, excuse me, has so far in the United States grossed $153.2 million, and around the world has grossed $363.7 million making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit around the world. So Dunkirk is doing really well, and it's doing especially well for award season. The Nut Job 2, Nutty by Nature, is not one of the five movies I am reviewing for this show. As I said, I have a rule about sequels. I have to see the original one before I see the sequel, and because I didn't see the nut, the original Nut Job... I did not see its sequel, but a lot of other people did because it grossed $8.3 million this weekend against a budget of $40 million. I don't have its international numbers for you, but I can tell you that it is not a hit yet here in the States, and it has a long way to go to recoup its budget. The Dark Tower was number one at the box office last week. This week, it took a pretty steep drop to number four, probably due to word of mouth. The Dark Tower grossed $7.8 million this weekend. Against a budget of $60 million, the Dark Tower has so far grossed $34.3 million here in the States and $53.6 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. And considering its steep drop, it may be a tentative hit at best, but it's probably not going to be a tentative hit anytime soon. That's probably because of bad word of mouth, but I'm just speculating. Girls Trip is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number four last week, but as you can tell from the numbers, there's nothing to worry about with Girls Trip. This weekend it made $6.5 million. Against a budget of $27.7 million, Girls Trip has so far made $97.1 million here in the States, and... Around the world, it has made $105.6 million, which means it is a a permanent hit here in the States and around the world. So, good for Girls Trip. The Emoji Movie is a movie that was number three at the box office last week. This week, it took a pretty steep drop to number six. Not as steep as The Dark Tower, actually is equally as steep as The Dark Tower, which means that negative word of mouth is also catching up to the Emoji Movie. This weekend it grossed $6.5 million, which was exactly the same as Girls Trip. 
But against a budget of $50 million, the Emoji Movie is so far ma made $63.4 million here in the States and $97.2 million around the world. So hate it or love it, the Emoji Movie is a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. And around the world is very, very close to being a certified hit. That was the word I was looking for the last time, a certified hit. But the Emoji Movie still has a ways to go here in the States for it to become certified. Around the world, it could be certified as soon as next week. <clears throat> Spider-Man Homecoming is number seven at the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number six last week. This weekend, it made $6 million even. Against a budget of $175 million, Spider-Man Homecoming has so far made a very impressive $306.4 million here in the States and $702.1 million around the world, which means it's a tentative hit here in the States. Around the world, it is a certified hit, so good for Spider-Man Homecoming. It should be a certified hit in about two weeks here in the States, but it is sliding after six weeks in release. Kidnap, starring Halle Berry, is a movie that started out okay at number five last week, this week it took a, an equally steep drop as the Emoji Movie and The Dark Tower, and it is now at number 8. This week it grossed $5.1 million at the box office. Against a budget of $20 million, Kidnap has so far made $19.3 million in the United States. I don't have how much money it made internationally, but it is not a hit yet here in the States, but it is very, very close to becoming a tentative hit here in the States, and it probably will be by next week. The Glass Castle is a movie that debuted third amongst debut movies this past weekend, but number ninth overall. It's not a very good start for that movie. This week, the Glass Ca excuse me, this weekend it made $4.7 million, and I don't have the budget the numbers for you in terms of how much it made or how much it made internationally. So I can't say what kind of hit it is, but rest assured, it is probably not a hit of any kind, either tentative or certified. And finally, Atomic Blonde is number 10 at the box office this weekend, having made $4.5 million in its third week in release, and that also slid three points from number 7 to number 10 this week. On a budget of $30 million, Atomic Blonde has so far made $42.7 million here in the States and $61.7 million around the world, making it tentative here in the States, certified worldwide. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and you are listening to Words on Film on bostonfreeradio.com, watching me on Somerville Community Access TV or some local TV station that picked up my show, or you're watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is a movie that's never been in the top 10 in my segment, What's Topping the Box Office, but I'm reviewing it first because I think it is a very important movie that any, everyone should see. That movie is an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power. It's a movie that is a documentary, and it's a little bit unlike its sequel, or rather the movie to which it is a sequel, An Inconvenient Truth. An Inconvenient Truth was a very fancy PowerPoint presentation. I'm not undermining its status as an Academy Award winning documentary, but An Inconvenient Sequel is a little bit more like a documentary than a PowerPoint presentation. Granted, there are PowerPoints in this which are hosted by Al Gore himself, but there's also a lot more to it documentary-wise, and I think that actually makes it a very powerful companion piece to An Inconvenient Truth, and An Inconvenient Sequel has, according to Al Gore, a lot of bad news, but also some very good news. And most of An Inconvenient Truth was bad news, but it kind of needed to be. So, one of the bad, bad pieces of news about An Inconvenient Sequel is that 2016 was the hottest year on record. That's the bad news. But the good news in this movie will surprise you. And I'm not going to exactly get into exactly what every single piece of good news is, but it certainly is a very stark documentary, but it is also a very hopeful one. 
And the movie was directed actually by two people, Bonnie Cohen and John Shank. And those were not actually the original documentary directors of An Inconvenient Truth. The director of that movie was Davis Guggenheim. I'm not sure why he didn't come back for this one, but he actually has, he's, he's been directing a number of really noteworthy documentaries ever since An Inconvenient Truth. He directed It Might Get Loud. He directed Waiting for Superman. But this movie could have used his directing expertise. But then again, Bonnie Cohen and John Schenck did a really good job directing this film as well. And as I said, it's not the exact same movie as An Inconvenient Truth. It's not the PowerPoint presentation updated for the year 2017. But it's really good that this movie is able to catch people up on what has changed since 2006. And one of the big things that has changed is that in 2006, our president, George W. Bush, was a climate change denier. And that's not just me spouting out conspiracy theories. To give you an example of what kind of climate change denier he is, he not only denied it in public, but also Michael Crichton wrote a semi-nonfiction book denying any proof of global warming. And he he actually had some valid points, but George W. Bush actually invited Michael Crichton to the White House after his book, book was published. So Al Gore came out with An Inconvenient Truth, and a lot of people disputed its claims. People are still disputing its claims to this day. But what was is significant about An Inconvenient Truth was it won Al Gore an Oscar, and a Nobel Prize. And to give you an idea of how significant an inconvenient truth is to this day, and not just in 06 and 07, going green is is something people are still talking about today. It's something that's in vogue. It's a la mode. It's in fashion. And it wasn't so much so in 04 or 05. So, an inconvenient sequel, I don't want to give away a lot of what's going on in this movie, but... Al Gore is very good at communicating, especially now since he's not a politician anymore. He's very good at communicating why global warming should not be a partisan issue. Why Democrats and Republicans should not be denying that it happens. And for the most part, Democrats are not denying that global warming is an issue. And some Republicans are on board as well. Unfortunately, not all Republicans, as is evidenced by our current president, Donald Trump. So, An Inconvenient Sequel is a movie that must be seen because, yeah, there are a lot of harsh truths to it. The one big harsh truth is that 2016 was the hottest year on record. And there was also one claim that Al Gore made in the original Inconvenient Truth in that if the global ice caps melted and the water rose, that a significant portion of Manhattan would be underwater. And Al Gore even said, as this movie was going on, that people said, and people are still saying, that's ridiculous, that could never happen. Well, it actually kind of did. It happened when Hurricane Sandy flooded the 9-11 memorial in 2012. Again, that's a hurricane, not an effect of the polar ice caps melting. But Al Gore also communicates very well what kind of effects global warming has on the world. And it's not just rising sea levels. There are a number of really disastrous events that have happened just in 2016 alone. One of the big reasons that 2016 was considered a really bad year, not for not just for America before the world was not just because of the presidential election although that was pretty bad but also the disastrous events that were going on um, in terms of weather there were hurricanes there were tornadoes there was a, there were several um, forest fires not just in America and one of the big takeaways with an inconvenient sequel truth to power is if you are a climate change denier, you have to see this movie. If you're not a climate change denier, you have to see this movie in order to figure out what we can do better. And fortunately with Al Gore, he he 
gives you this information without the grain of salt, but he also is an optimist. And I think we really need an optimist for this kind of information. And An Inconvenient Sequel, in case you didn't know, gets my rating of a knockout. It's a chilling documentary, but it's hopeful and you must see it. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to review is not as crucial or as significant as An Inconvenient Sequel, unfortunately. But, of course, it was a popular movie this week, which is, why, which is part of the reason why I'm reviewing it. It was Annabelle Creation, which, much to my surprise, was number one at the box office this weekend. It is rated R, not PG-13, which is what most, uh, which was what actually a surprising number of horror films have been rated over the last 20 years. But still, it is a film that I was kind of mixed about, and I'll tell you exactly why when I get into the review. Twelve years after the tragic death of their little girl, a doll maker and his wife welcome a nun and several girls from a shuttered orphanage into their home, soon becoming the target of the doll maker's possessed creation, Annabelle. So, Annabelle Creation is a prequel not only to The Conjuring, but also to 2014's Annabelle. In 2014's Annabelle, you see a couple who are living in the late 60s, and they like to collect dolls, and that's how they brought this really creepy Annabelle doll into their home, and the movie progresses from there. My biggest problem with the original Annabelle movie, which in and of itself was a prequel to The Conjuring, was that it ripped off Rosemary's Baby, and the doll Annabelle was nothing more than a MacGuffin. In other words, if you have a doll as creepy as Annabelle, Annabelle should be a character. It doesn't necessarily have to be like Chucky in the Child's Play movies, but you would think a, a doll like that would come to life, not that some something else would, would move its arms outside of the doll's body. I know that's kind of confusing, but if you've seen the movie, you probably know what I mean. So anyway, Annabelle Creation, it's not quite determined where, where or when the movie takes place, but it probably takes place sometime in the 50s. Having one of those subtitles telling you what year it took place probably would have cleared some things up quite a bit. But you're introduced to Samuel Mullins, who's played by Anthony LaPaglia, and his wife Esther, who's played by Miranda Otto. They have a daughter whose name is B, who's played by Samara Lee, who, as these movies go, they're a happy, functional family, and Samuel, Samuel Mullins makes a living creating dolls. He creates creepy dolls, but I guess that's just me speaking from the perspective of a man who never played with dolls, or rarely played with dolls as a kid. And... When I see these dolls in his workshop, I immediately want to go running and screaming, but I guess Anthony LaPaglia in this film is a sane person and just wants to create dolls for other girls' enjoyment, including his own daughter. Well, as this movie goes, B is... Uh, his daughter, B, is killed suddenly and surprisingly. Well, surprisingly in this universe not surprising to people who are watching the movie. So the movie cuts from his daughter being killed to this group of female orphans and one woman, Sister Charlotte, a nun, who's played by Stephanie Sigmund, going from their shuttered orphanage to this man's house. Why this man decided to open his house up to become an orphanage, I don't know. And by the way, this guy's house is out pretty much in the boonies in the desert. So there is a lot of questions here about why he stopped making dolls, which he has, why he opened up his house to become an orphanage. I don't know why that was either. And also why his wife, Esther, is in hiding. Granted, it's one of the creepier parts of this movie to see Esther, who's played by Miranda Otto, shuttered in her bedroom, almost kind of Howard Hughes-like in the sense that she has her drapes drawn and she rarely allows her the door to her bedroom to be open except maybe to be served food by her husband Samuel. 
So, as this movie goes, there is a locked room which one of the girls, uh, a crippled girl named Janice, who's played by Talitha Bateman, goes in despite Samuel Mullins telling her not to go in there. Of course, when she does go in there, she finds a nursery full, full of a lot of toys. So, it's understandable that she'd go into this room, even though it's a little dark and creepy, because if it's a room full of toys, you can't help yourself, right? Well, she opens the door and finds that creepy doll, Annabelle, there. And you would think the doll is possessed, which it kind of is, but again, the doll doesn't exactly come to life. The movie, unfortunately, makes you think that the doll is coming to life, but it's just controlled by some sort of demon which you actually see in other words the demon is kind of on the side of the doll moving the arms and otherwise just chasing after the person so in the end of the, at the end of the day the annabelle doll is creepy but it's just a doll and it's just there i gotta say that the acting in this movie is better than it was in annabelle and i liked the fact that the movie was a lot more original than 2014's Annabelle. As I said previously, that Annabelle was just a Rosemary's Baby ripoff. Annabelle creation it has a more original plot than I'd seen before, and a lot of the actors in the movie, including Anthony LaPaglia, Samara Lee, Stephanie Sigmund, do well with what they're given. But a lot of the details, so some of the small details of the 1950s, aren't there or aren't quite accurate. And that's the first problem with this movie. Also, I didn't think it was as scary as it could have been. So I credit Annabelle Creation for, for having a more original plot and being a little bit scarier than the original 2014 Annabelle. But for this movie, it's still not enough. And it gets my rating of a strikeout. Again, it's helped by its acting, it's helped by its originality, but it's not scary enough. And if you have a doll as creepy as Annabelle, you might as well have it come to life and not have somebody act you see actually pulling the figurative strings. Again, there are some close-ups of the Annabelle doll, and I thought to myself, if that Annabelle doll even batted an eyelash, let alone did anything else, I'd be creeped out entirely. So the suspense was there, but the payoff was not. And again, Annabelle should be used more as a MacGuffin. It doesn't have to be a Chucky ripoff, but it has to do something, and it didn't in this movie. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next movie I'm going to be reviewing is The Glass Castle, which seems like Oscar bait. It's based on a best-selling memoir written by Jeanette Walls, and it has a lot of Academy Award winning and Academy Award nominated actors in it, including Brie Larson, Woody Harrelson, and Naomi Watts. However, it debuted not so strongly at number nine at the box office this weekend, but enough about box office returns. How is this movie? Before I get into that, let me give you a synopsis of what it's about. It is a true story about a young girl whose name is Jeanette, who comes of age in a dysfunctional family of nonconformist nomads with a mother who's an eccentric artist and an alcoholic father who would stir the children's imaginations with hope as a distraction to their poverty. So the movie was directed by Destin Daniel Cretton, who has directed such movies so far as I Am Not a Hipster from 2012 and Short Term 12 from 2013. He has written some movies lately, such as The Shack, which I didn't see, but came out this year, earlier this year, to mixed reviews. And Mr. Cretton has written the screenplay to this movie, along with Andrew Langham, Lanham, and it is, of course, based on the best-selling 2005 memoir by gossip columnist Jeanette Walls. And you really get an appreciation from seeing this movie about how far... Jeanette Walls has come, especially considering that she had a dysfunctional family of nomads who basically scraped along to get by. In fact, there are some stark images of the poverty that these, these kids and this family had to endure. One time in their house in West Virginia, one of the few places they 
actually stayed for a prolonged period of time. There was so little food in the house that all four kids had to eat butter mixed in with sugar. And I actually had to turn my face away from the screen in order just to get that disgusting image out of my head of people actually eating butter whole. Ugh, it's still... Of course, I like a little bit of butter, but eating it from the stick... Yeah, eh, not something you'd do, and probably something you'd do in desperation. But you then learn that these kids had not actually eaten for three days, and that's unfortunately because of their father's alcoholism, which led them probably to the destitution they lived right here. So the Glass Castle has some very good performances. Brie Larson, Woody Harrelson do extremely well in this movie. I actually thought Naomi Watts probably should have been a stronger character. And something tells me, even though I haven't read the book, that Naomi, um, rather Jeanette Walls' mother, being an eccentric artist, had more to do with the narrative in Jeanette Walls' upbringing than this movie suggested. Here, it's almost a given that... Naomi Watts' character is an artist. And you wonder, is she just painting because she likes to paint? Or is she trying to actually sell these paintings? You never know and you never see Naomi Watts' character, whose name is Rosemary, actually try to sell these paintings. In fact, there's one scene that probably should have been the starkest scene in this movie, but it flew by way too quickly. And even though I haven't read the book, I've heard people who have read the book describe the scene to me. So, Jeanette, who's played in this movie in her adult form by Brie Larson, is a gossip columnist for New York Magazine, and she's doing extremely well for herself. She lives in Manhattan, and she lives in an apartment, and she's able to go out to dinner um, with her fiancé, David, who's played in this movie by a very good-looking man named Max Greenfield. So, Jeanette is in a taxi cab, and she's looking down at her shoes, wondering if she's picked out the right ones for the evening. And then she looks to her right out the window and sees a woman going through a dumpster. And this woman is presumably homeless. As it turns out, that woman is her mother. So this movie, this part of the movie flies by really quickly because it's much starker in the book, I'd imagine, because you... Me be living in Boston, I see homeless people ruffling through garbage all the time. It's one thing to see that. It's another thing to actually know the person. It's another thing altogether to be related to that person, especially since these people who are ruffling through the garbage actually raise you. That's ironic and sad. But this movie doesn't really have time to reflect on that irony or reflect on that sadness. In fact, it just kind of goes right through it, which is one of the big problems with The Glass Castle. It feels like it's not as raw or as stark as it could be. Woody Harrelson does a good job here playing Rex, who is Jeanette Wall's dysfunctional and nomadic father. And of course, there are scenes where he succumbs to his alcoholism, even though he promised a young Jeanette he wouldn't drink anymore. And those scenes are sad. And some of them are intense. However, it's ironic to me that Woody Harrelson is clean-shaven throughout the whole movie. Because if you're a nomad who barely scrapes by and barely keeps your family fed, you probably wouldn't invest in razors, right? Well, yeah, Woody Allen... Uh, not Woody Allen. Woody Harrelson looks a little too good for this movie. Granted, he's, he's almost a given to play a hillbilly because of his accent, but and I hope people don't take that the wrong way. And also, Naomi Watts looked a little too good in some of these scenes as well. Her hair was a little too straight, and I, I was just a little taken aback by how glossy this film looked and how it didn't quite look as stark as it probably should have. I'm not saying it needed to be exploitative. No movie needs to be exploitative, except for ones that are purposefully exploitation. But I didn't really get the sense of the desperation of this family, particularly the children, as I should have felt. And the later scenes 
with an adult Jeanette, again played by Brie Larson, confronting her parents, has some dramatic gravitas to it, but unfortunately not enough. And I think this narrowly misses the Oscar status it hopes for. It gets my rating of a checkout because I thought the acting, particularly by Brie Larson and Woody Harrelson, was good. But again, I thought the movie looked too good, and it felt like a Cliff's Notes version of this memoir. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Maudie. Maudie is a film you probably haven't heard of unless you've been frequenting your local art house cinema. And this is a co-production of film companies in Ireland and Canada. And the movie actually takes place in Nova Scotia from the 1930s to the 1960s. And it tells the true story of artist Maud Lewis, who painted at her rural home in Nova Scotia. Now, Maud Lewis was arthritic. And at, at, when I was watching this film, it's not exactly shown what her diagnosis actually is. I guess it was cerebral palsy, but it turns out she is just severely arthritic. And this Nova Scotian woman, woman Maud, or as she's known, Maudie, hence the title of this movie, works as a housekeeper while she hones her skills as an artist and be eventually becomes a beloved figure not only in her small town in Nova Scotia, but also around the world. In fact, when the 50s came around and the TV became a more influential use of communication, the CBC actually came to document Maude Lewis, and her paintings became literally world-renowned. In fact, then Vice President Richard Nixon actually commissioned to have one of her paintings hanging in one of his offices. So there's a lot of history behind this. You won't find any Chirons telling you what exact date it is. In fact, there are a lot of clues based on what, what cars people are driving, what clothes people are wearing to give you a general sense of what year this movie takes place. So Sally Hawkins plays Maude Lewis in this film in a role that I think has a very good chance of getting Sally Hawkins an Oscar nomination. She is really good in this movie. She plays someone, again, who's severely arthritic, so much so you can see it in the way she walks and the way she holds her arms. And she begins a relationship with a very mono, mono syllabic and stoic man by the name of Everett Lewis, who is played in this movie in an interestingly casting choice, or an interesting casting choice by Ethan Hawke. And the strange thing about Ethan Hawke is he has played a variety of roles. Usually a lot of the roles he plays, particularly in movies like Boyhood, is a guy who's very laid back, kind of easygoing and convivial. But in this movie, he plays someone who's very rough around the edges and somebody who doesn't talk a lot and also has a very short temper. So I say that Ethan Hawke is interestingly cast, but he's not miscast in this film because to Ethan Hawke's credit, he actually does show a, a, a new range of of acting, which he hasn't shown in any other movie he's been in to date. And I'm thinking about even the roles he took as a kid, like in Explorers or Dead Poet Society. So kudos to Ethan Hawke for this role. I can't say whether or not he will be nominated for an Oscar. I could never say. But he certainly has a chance of getting nominated for a Golden Globe. But Sally Hawkins is the actress who pretty much owns this movie as she should. She disappears into this role, and I don't think she lets up for a single second. In fact, it's kind of painful at first to watch her get around her house, or get around even town. And the movie starts up sometime in the 1930s, and even though it is Canada, it's, it's still the Great Depression, which, while it was very... <laughs> While it was very hard for people in the United States, other surrounding countries like Canada also had their dealings with the Great Depression as well. And I think that showing Maude walk from one building to another, particularly in this coastal rural town, is 
Well, it, it's difficult to watch her, but it's also very admirable to see how much determination she has. So, there is a lot to like about Maudi. It is somewhat of a slow film. It's one hour and 55 minutes, but it's a movie that takes its time, and it does take place over the course of roughly 30 years. You go from seeing Maudi as a somewhat helpless, arthritic woman to seeing someone who's come into her own, but also her health is very much fading. And you also see the relationship progress between her and Ethan uh, Hawke's character, who, again, Ethan Hawke's character is named Everett, Everett Lewis. And you see them go from, well, employer and employee to eventually husband and wife, and seeing them go through the hard times and the good times of their marriage. So, as I said... I've got about two minutes left. I don't know what else there is to say about the movie, Maudie, but it's a very good film. It definitely t takes advantage of the on-location shooting in Nova Scotia. In fact, Nova Scotia looks beautiful in this movie, and this movie, it, had it get, been given a wider release, might actually persuade some people to visit Nova Scotia sometime. Maybe I will someday. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But I, it's also a movie that makes me appreciate the influence of artists on society. In fact, there is some really great set design in this film. When you first visit Ethan Hawke's character's house, again, Everett's house, it's very dark, it's very run down, and you can almost in the theater, smell the mustiness of the place. But then when Madi starts painting on the walls, despite Everett's problem with it at first, the, the house begins to gradually get brighter and brighter, and certainly indicative of the film here. So Madi gets my rating of a knockout. I think it's one of the best performances of the year by Sally Hawkins. Ethan Hawke does a good job being in somewhat unfamiliar territory. But even though this movie doesn't tell you much in terms of a written epilogue at the end, it actually does show you the real Maude Lewis at the end through home movies and footage of CBC documentaries. And you get a sense of how much research Sally Hawkins did to prepare for this role, and it really is admirable. I would like to see her get some award consideration for this role, because she really owned this film. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the last movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Naked. This is the latest from Marlon Wayans, who stars in the movie, and it is a Netflix original that debuted this past Friday, August 11th. So you don't have to go to the theater to see this movie, just have a Netflix subscription, and you will be good to go. Or will you? So for those of you who have been paying attention to my show, you might remember, and if you don't remember, I'll tell you, my worst movies of 2016 list. 2016 was a bad year, not necessarily for movies, but the movie that I listed as the worst movie of the year was Fifty Shades of Black, the thinly veiled parody of Fifty Shades of Grey, which should have been better than Fifty Shades of Grey, but it wasn't. And the main reason for that was because of Marlon Wayans. Mainly because he is a comic actor who tries way too hard and also takes every, just about every negative black stereotype and wallows in it. He just takes all the negative black stereotypes, mix them, mixes them up in a blender, and, and then just applies them to his face like he is in a mud bath, basically. So I was very skeptical, skeptical about Naked. I didn't think it would be a very good movie. And even though Fifty Shades of Black did relatively well at the movies, I think movie theaters and movie companies were wise not to put this movie in theaters because Marlon Wayans needs to grow up. He is a 45-year-old man who is still doing stupid comedy. Or so I thought. Well, Naked is not a particularly sophisticated movie. It's also not a particularly original movie. But to Marlon Wayans' credit, 
there are no black stereotypes in this film. At least he doesn't take the really negative ones involving drug use and weaves and big noses. And if you think this stuff is offensive, me saying it, trust me, these are things that Marlon Wayans has actually joked about in his previous movies, especially Fifty Shades of Black. So, Naked, what is the movie about? It it is about a guy who's naked, yes, but it's more about a guy who is nervous about finally getting married, and he is forced to relive the same nerve-wracking hours over and over again until he gets things right on his wedding day. So, when when I said to you the same hours over and over again until he gets things right, you're probably reminded of one particular movie, Groundhog Day. And you would be absolutely correct. And there are other movies that have followed the same kind of plot as Groundhog Day, most notably the 2015 film Edge of Tomorrow, which was Tom Cruise's last great movie to date. It wasn't too long ago, but still, it was a better movie than I would have expected. It had a really cheesy title, I get that, and there were some weaknesses in Tom Cruise acting, but overall, the premise of the film... and overrode the fact that it could have been easily compared to Groundhog Day. Here, you are immediately reminded of Groundhog Day. So, Marlon Wayans plays a substitute teacher named Rob Anderson, who is getting married to a doctor named Megan, who is played by Regina Hall. Of course, there is the disapproving father-in-law, Reginald Swope, who is played by Dennis Haysbert, and there are other members of this bridal party who are, well, not exactly helpful in easing Rob Anderson's cold feet in getting married. I don't think he has any particular cold feet in getting married to Regina Hall, because honestly, who would? I I would get married to Regina Hall in a heartbeat if I could, provided I probably knew her a little bit well, uh, knew, knew her a little bit better in real life probably assured that she felt the same way about me. Basically, the point is, once you win the affections of of a woman like Regina Hall, you do not want to let her go. But anyway, Rob Anderson is nervous about several things about the wedding, and one night when Megan is at her bachelorette party, Rob decides to get a drink, one drink, with his friend and best man, Benny, who's played by J.T. Jackson. Well, after he decides to get the drink, he doesn't remember anything for the rest of the night, and he finds himself naked on the floor of an elevator of a hotel. And, of course, him being naked and trying to get around the city of Charlottesville, South Carolina, where this movie is filmed, is, of course, not a very easy thing to do. To make matters worse, when things get really bad and after an hour passes... Everything that just happened in the last hour is wiped clean, and he is back on the elevator floor naked. So he is trying to get some clothes on and get to the wedding and make sure everything is perfect for his bride, his bride to be or his wife to be is probably a more accurate thing. And of course, this movie is riddled with a lot of wedding movie cliches. Of course, there is the easy comparison to Groundhog Day, which is not completely unheard of. But there's also, as I said, Dennis Haysbert plays the disapproving father-in-law. Marlon Wayans, again, plays a man-child who doesn't seem to grow up. He's a substitute teacher who's offered the chance to be a full-time teacher at an elite prep school, and he is somehow reluctant about taking that. Why? I don't know. The movie never explains. There's also a case of Megan's ex-boyfriend, whose name is Cody, who is a very rich man who's played by Scott Foley. He's rich, he's handsome, and he's cocky as hell. And, of course, his arriving at the wedding causes the usual amount of conflict. So as I said, this movie is not as bad as Fifty Shades of Black, mainly because the black stereotypes are kept at an absolute minimum, at least according to my vantage point. And Marlon Wayans overacts. He sometimes tries way too hard to be funny. He makes the funny faces. He tries to kind of do the whole body motions all over the place. 
A lot of times he tries way too hard. He's funniest when he doesn't try as hard. One of the moments where I laughed in this movie is where he tells somebody to call an ambulance and the guy says, why? And Marlon Wayans walks into a pole. Now, he doesn't scream when he walks into a pole. He just walks into a pole, falls over. That's funny. The reason that's funny is because Marlon Wayans has the physicality to be a physical comedian. He certainly has the energy, but he's best when he's not trying to be Jim Carrey. Still, this movie is has way too many cliches. I laughed about five or six times. It gets my rating of a strikeout, but it is an improvement for Marlon Wayans. You wanted to be a teacher. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed the five movies I'm going to review, or I promised you I would review, now it's time to get into what's coming out next. These are the top movies that are going to be coming out in theaters near you, unless I state otherwise. And usually when I give you the rundown of these films, again, I'm not necessarily saying that these are going to be good movies or they're going to be bad movies. I'm just telling you what I am speculating about these films. And I'll also tell you whether or not I'm going to see them. Again, there's no guarantee that I'm going to see a movie, but if I tell you I'm not going to see a movie, I won't see it. And that's the case with a lot of sequels like the Transformers movie that came out a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago rather, and the Nut Job 2, Nutty by Nature, which came out last week. I told you I wasn't going to see those movies and I kept to that promise. So anyway, what's coming out this coming weekend? The big movie is The Hitman's Bodyguard. This is a new movie starring Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson. This is a movie about the world's top bodyguard who gets a new client, a hitman who must testify at the International Court of Justice. I don't know if that court actually exists, but moving on. They must put their differences aside and work together to make it to the trial on time. So, Ryan Reynolds has proven himself in action films as of late, especially given Deadpool. I still think he kind of lacks in terms of being a comic relief character, but a lot of people who found Deadpool particularly funny have at least disagreed with me on that one, and I say we'll agree to disagree, but Ryan Reynolds and Samuel L. Jackson might make a pretty good team. Either way, this is a movie I probably will see, and when I see it, I will let you know what I think. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend is a strange film with an all-star cast, and it is called Logan Lucky. This is a movie about two brothers who attempt to pull off a heist during a NASCAR race in North Carolina. Steven Soderbergh directs this movie, coming back to the heist drama that he, of course, directed pretty well in the Ocean's Eleven films. This movie stars Channing Tatum, Adam Driver, and introduces Daniel Craig. I'm not sure why introducing Daniel Craig of all actors would be something. I mean, again, Daniel Craig needs no introduction. He's played James Bond four times and is probably going to play him a fifth time, at least, let's hope. <laughs> Please, Daniel Craig, play James Bond one more time. But, again, this is a movie I will also probably see this weekend, and I will let you know what I think when I see it. And if I don't see it this week, I will probably see it next week for you guys. Another movie that's coming out in probably limited release is a movie called Patty Cakes. And Patty Cakes is actually spelled kind of strangely. Um, the, it's about a woman whose first name is Patty and whose last name is Cakes. And the S in her name is a dollar sign, kind of like what Kesha used to be. Ka-dollar sign, ha, as she was previously facetiously known. So anyway, Patty Cakes is centered on an aspiring rack rapper by the name of Patricia Dombrowski, a.k.a. Killa P, a.k.a. Patty Cakes, who is fighting an unlikely quest for glory in her downtrodden hometown in New Jersey. So the rapper Patty Cakes is played by a Caucasian actress and a heavyset actress named Danielle McDonald. And she's been in a couple of films but nothing really of note. She guest starred on a couple of TV shows, including one episode of Two Broke Girls, one episode of The Middle, one episode of American Horror Story. So this is her breakout role in this film. And I got to tell you, it looks interesting. You don't see a ton of movies about white rappers, 
there's Eight Mile, and of course there's Kicking It Old School with Jamie Kennedy, but forget about that one. So I'm interested to see how this movie turns out. It's listed as a drama, but there are probably some funny parts. And I can't guarantee that I'm going to see this movie, but if it's playing at a theater theater near me, such as the Coolidge Corner Theater, my favorite Boston theater, I will check it out and I will let you know what I think. Last movie I'm going to tell you about is a movie, Gook, which is a movie with a predominantly African-American cast. I'm not sure if Gook is a racial slur, but it sounds like one. And it's about two Korean-American brothers named Eli and Daniel, who own a struggling shoe store and have an unlikely friendship with Camilla, a streetwise 11-year-old African-American girl. Camilla ditches school, Eli stresses about the store, and Daniel tries to have a good time. It's just another typical day at the store until the Rodney King verdict is read and riots break out. Oh, this looks really good. So it's unrated. It's actually... It hasn't been rated by the MPAA yet. It's only 94 minutes, but it looks like a period piece. It is a period piece. I'm going to look out for that one. Can't guarantee I'll see it, but I will tell you that I'm running out of time. And you've been listening to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, saying I'll see you at the movies. You are all...